This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. My name is Bill Garber. I'm the Director of Government and External Relations of the Appraisal Institute. It is April 23rd, 2020. And we're here to discuss the Pay Paycheck Protection Program, which is a small business relief program that is managed by the Small Business Administration that is assisting small businesses in weathering the COVID-19 crisis. The Paycheck Protection Program provides loan forgiveness for retaining employees by temporary, temporarily expanding the traditional SBA 7A loan program. Currently, the program, the PPP program has run out of money given the strong demand for the program itself. But as we speak, Congress is considering a measure to recapitalize the program. And for real estate appraisers, it's a program that's been of interest since the CARES Act was enacted by Congress. And several or many real estate appraisal firms have been negatively impacted like many other small businesses across the country as loan volumes have compressed and real estate activity has ground to a halt in almost every sector across the country. So the Appraisal Institute has received and has fielded many questions about the various CARES Act measures. There's also a program called the EIDL program, which provides up to $10,000 of economic relief the businesses that are currently experiencing temporary difficulties, but we're going to talk specifically to the PPP program today. And of course, this should not be taken as any kind of legal or accounting advice for real estate appraisers, but we have brought in an appraisal institute professional, Daniel Frazy, who has successfully navigated the SBA PPP program with a local lender. And we wanted to hear from him, his experiences and what kind of advice that he would have for real estate appraisers and AI professionals. So Dan, thanks very much for joining me this morning. I appreciate your time and uh, congratulations on the successful navigation with PPP so far. Hey Bill, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my experience uh, and introduction. Um, again, my name is Daniel Frazy, and I'm a partner at uh, Keller Craig and Associates. Uh, we're a mid-sized commercial appraisal firm in Kansas City. Um, so my experience with uh, the PPP loan process, um, I was very early on in the process. I, I watched, you know, the bill go to the House, go to well, pass the pass the Senate um, in March, and. Uh, I reached out to my local credit union that uh, we're members with uh, at that time to see if they were going to be participating in the program. Uh, they indicated they were and they would be ready uh, when it passed the House and was finalized in the law. Uh, that occurred, um, I believe, April 2nd, April 3rd. Um, I started uh, to talk to my CPA, other bankers involved, you know, they're applications opening up that day. Some banks were more ready than others. Uh, my institution, they sent me a link to a preliminary application at uh, 1025 at night. I was in my pajamas in bed. And so I got out of bed at 1025, you know, ran downstairs, filled out the application and uh, got that uploaded. What I didn't know at the time was that was a preliminary application. That had nothing to do with the final uh, application I had to go through. So uh, my credit union uses a third party processor, uh, which a lot of the small financial institutions do. So they had to pass that along. So then there, there was approximately from April 3rd through April 7th, uh, I just kind of waited. Um, so I received another application through email on April 7th from the third party processor uh, to request full documentation. Uh, the documents they requested were extensive. Uh, 
Uh, just a, a quick uh, list of those. They wanted my articles of organization, uh, our operating agreement, bylaws, partnership, all that information. They wanted front and back of driver's license for anyone uh, who had an ownership stake in the business. Uh, they wanted uh, monthly payrolls, annual payrolls, 2019 tax returns. They wanted year to date 2020 payroll statements. They wanted payroll statements by individual employee. They wanted account of uh, full-time equivalent employees, uh, and uh, quarterly 941s, annual 940s, which at the time I didn't even know what those were. <laughs> um, I, mm -hmm. We had a really good uh, bookkeeper that was able to put a lot of these documents together for us. Uh, so I was ready for to fill out that application within a day. Um, again, a lot of people are gonna have that extensive background or documentation ready. Uh, most small businesses don't. Uh, and you know, I can see how this process could be extremely frustrating <laughs> for a lot of small business owners. Yeah, um, if you could, that's a great intro to it. If you could, could you talk a little bit about the size of your firm and structure and then how were you handling payroll and accounting work going into this? Uh, okay, so yeah, we have approximately 20 full-time employees. Um, we're an LLC, like most small businesses. Uh, we have a part-time bookkeeper that does payroll. Uh, we use QuickBooks accounting software, which I'm sure a lot of people do. Uh, so we're, we're pretty well prepared uh, to have those statements available. So that kind of question that you were getting was part of their underwriting process. Was, was that to help this establish threshold levels or what was what was being done there? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, my interpretation, com it's completely my opinion, is that you know, the banks were concerned, you know, about being repaid from the government. So they want to do extensive, their normal standard due diligence and underwriting. So they requested what the typical documents were. Uh, there is no information about what documents are or are not required on the SBA website. The SBA has a simple three page application that you can log into their website and download right now. Um, my original thought was, oh, this is gonna be a breeze, three-page three, three page application, here's some basic information, easy. But it was uh, assembling the underwriting documents that really took some time and were, to my understanding, not fully required. So is there, do they, is there any way to determine how they're evaluating your, your revenues as an appraisal firm uh, and the impacts and and whether it's a seasonal business or uh, how you know what's the the your feeling about how they're evaluating the economic injury to you to you as an appraisal firm that's a great question and so the threshold on that application from the sba website uh the boxes you have to check the primary one is the current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant it's very generic you know uh as long there there are no definitive examples of that definition um so if you're being injured by this economic uncertainty, then you qualify. So there's probably multiple ways to illustrate that. And it just depends on your company's setup arrangement and, and the type of work that you're doing, I would imagine. Yeah, it's it's really to support payroll. It's to keep the employees on through the next two months, you know, so they're receiving full pay. Um, and that, that That's my understanding. So I should point out, there's a lot of great information on the SBA website. There's FAQs that are available. And these are, of course, being updated as they go along. There's additional guidance that's coming out. 
there's even been some some changes of inter of interpretation on a couple of, of points as to documentation that that a small business can provide and how it might relate to uh, partnership arrangements, uh, 1099 forms versus K-1s and the like. Uh, I think you had, you had seen uh, uh, some recent guidance on that subject. Yes, uh, a couple of accounting websites um, are now indicating that uh, partnerships can also use their K-1 income as part of payroll, which that wasn't the original uh, understanding of this at all. However, there's been so many changes ongoing with these laws. Uh, in the original uh, act passed by Congress, uh, 1099 income was originally discussed as being added and including payroll if you had 1099 employees, which didn't make a lot of sense, you know, because a 1099 isn't an employee at all. That's a, a independent contractor who has their own company. So it, it it would open up the possibility for double dipping. So they quickly pushed more guidance, I believe April 5th, that said, no, you cannot include 1099 uh, income into that. Uh, I've seen the guidance both ways on the K-1, which is passed through income for LLCs and partnerships. Uh, whether to include that since you're not paying FICA taxes or whether you can only include your payroll. Uh, we really focused on the payroll aspect. We didn't include any of that. Uh, the other big question I came across that's not really clear was, do I base my payroll on year-to-date or annualized 2019 or is it the trailing 12 months? The SBA's uh, guidance said one thing, actual pay, uh, care act said another uh the my understanding is now you you can use either um it's whichever is higher um i used to, we used to, uh trailing 12 months uh i know some firms used uh, 2019 uh we were all approved so it's up for the air in, in terms of interpretation the other uh question i had when filling this information out was we have three part-time employees, so uh, how, do, how do I count the number of employees? Because a big part of this, you have to maintain the same number of uh, employees before and after the program. So what is that original count? It's going to be pretty important with how you calculate that number in the future. So uh, with three part-time employees, my guidance from my CPA was to uh, do full-time equivalent which, you know, if they're working 20 hours, uh, then, you know, that's a half, you know, it's a half a full-time worker. So we ended up with 20.5 20, full-time <laughs> employees, which that's going to be a question uh, when it comes to the forgiveness. Um, sure, and again, yeah, establishing a baseline. Yes, yep. No, that, that makes sense. And again, I suggest that people refer to the latest guidance from from the SBA and and also talk with their their of course their their accounting and, and potentially legal professional if they need to yes the uh so walk us through what happened from there once you you submitted an application uh, were able to find an institution what was your process going forward from there uh, with regard to notifications uh, a lot of stress, Bill, a lot of stress <laughs> and, and waiting. Uh, so there was a, the third party processor approved the application. I received a SBA loan number on April 10th. Um, then communication went silent. So for 10 days, I don't know anything else. You know, all this is in the portal. Uh, no one ever reached out to me. No one contacted me. Uh, I contacted my uh, credit union uh, representative and uh, asked her kind of what, what's the process from here. Basically, it's a 10-day waiting period. Uh, they are required as part of the CARE Act to fund your account within 10 days and they took every day of that 10 days it was it was like 11 p.m after 10 days the the funding came through so uh it was also interesting reading other uh 
online um, other <laughs> people's experiences with other banks and other uh, uh, fintech institutions in this process. Um, a lot of people used uh, starting, I think, uh, it's pretty late in the process, maybe April 14th, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, the SBA gave PayPal, Intuit QuickBooks, all these fintech firms the ability to jump in and start providing these uh, PPP loans. And uh, from what I read online, people were having those processed within 24 hours and the funding in their account. And it's not going into their PayPal account. It was going into the bank account of their choosing. So they, I think they did a really good job funding. I think uh, the winner in this was also the small credit union local banks that uh, didn't have the rush of applicants. Um, I can't remember the number. I think Bank of America had 100,000 applicants in five minutes or so. It was something crazy. There's some information out there as far as the number of applications going into Chase mm -hmm. and Bank of America. And it, it was overwhelming for all financial institutions. Uh, and so- I can imagine. So maybe going local is, gets a, gets a uh, little softer touch. Yes, yes, I would definitely focus on your existing, if you're gonna apply for this, focus on your existing banking uh, relationships um, and also apply multiple places. Um, my original thought was, oh, if I apply multiple places, then they might cancel out or I won't get it. That is not correct. You can apply multiple places. As soon as you receive an actual SBA loan number, all the other applications you have out there, when they try to push it through, they'll get denied. So it's the first institution with your application that makes it to the finish line. I would apply through <laughs> probably looking back a FinTech, for, uh, FinTech firm, uh, a local bank and possibly a national bank because maybe they'll be more prepared this time around to uh, push through those applications. A lot of it was technology driven. When you have, what, 1.7 million loan applications to do in 30 days, I mean, I know my local credit union had to build that online portal for that preliminary application. And that's what they were working on up to the day. Same with uh, the national companies, they're all building out technology and, uh, the smaller local banks that were doing the work by hand on paper were able to submit right away the two page application. Yeah, that's really good advice. So let's try to bring this home a little bit for appraisal firm operators. You know, this has to be a, a relief to you, at least for the next period ahead, you're, you're gonna be able to retain employees and service clients going forward, which is part of the goal here. But what are you, what are your thoughts as an appraisal firm operator uh, on, on some of those issues, serviceability and the like? That's a good question. Uh, you know, as a small business owner, my number one concern is business and uh, keeping my employees, you know, paid and uh, taken care of. So uh, I think appraisers, uh, the appraisal, profession is being hit hard, I think you should apply uh, if you have that opportunity. Um, you know, that's, I think that's all I have. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So uh, any final words or suggestions for appraisal professionals that are interested in pursuing this? Any last words of advice for them if they're either in the track or starting from scratch? Get your documentation ready, uh, be prepared, speak with accountants, speak with lawyers, speak with bankers, get on the phone. Uh, don't wait. You need to get it into the day. The lines are long. Uh, the best places, I think, are going to be the smaller financial institutions. They received a special uh, portion of the funds. I think it's $60 billion. So you need to find one of the institutions that has access to those funds and try to get in the get in the key 
Yeah, that's a good point. And I think in the, the current bill that's being considered by Congress this week that recapitalizes the program uh, $300 billion and $10 billion in, in uh, loan processing fees. And part of that is uh, some carve outs, specific carve outs for underbanked and underserved markets. Uh, so things like uh, smaller credit unions will have broader eligibility. I think there's some broadened eligibility in and around uh, agricultural operations uh, and also community development financial institutions, CDFI organizations, which are kind of like small nonprofit uh, financial entities, uh, community development type efforts. So those will be some potentially new sources of, of PPP, PPP funding going forward. So again, um, I would consult the sba.gov website for more information, for latest guidance, talk to your local professionals, and uh, also as, as appraisers, um, talk with your peers who are experiencing and uh, going through some of the same issues as you are. Uh, and that's why I really appreciate uh, Dan Frazee, Frazee's time this morning, uh, sharing your experiences uh, and, and trying to help appraisers through uh, what's a very, very difficult time right now. So Daniel, appreciate your time. Uh, again, Daniel Frazee, MAI, and um, this will be a wrap up for our program today on PPP. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Daniel.